Hi, I'm Thomas. Welcome to the Parachute Advice Podcast. My life has taken a lot of twists and turns, and on this podcast, I will dive into those experiences. The goal is to help everyone listening learn from my experiences and hopefully avoid some of the mistakes I've made. Hi, welcome to today's episode of the Parachute Advice Podcast. I'm your host, Thomas. Today, I want to discuss different methods I use to cook and ideas for dishes. This episode won't dive too deep into recipes, but is more about the big ideas. Something I came to realize over the journey is how important it is to mix things up. While I don't mind eating the same thing for weeks at a time or doing the same leftovers for lunch over the course of a week, after some period of time, I tend to get bored. Plus, I really enjoy cooking after I work out during the week. I feel so accomplished after doing a solid 20 or 30 minute workout and then making a great dinner. On top of that, after spending more than 12 years in the restaurant business and having gotten a culinary degree, I think it's pretty clear I love cooking. I was never the most creative chef, but I did enjoy the challenge. Give me a new recipe or concept and I will dive headfirst into learning it and then trying to master it. As a result, I usually do a big meal on Sundays for my lunches for the week. That's if I plan to take leftovers for the week. Right now, I've been all about salads and canned tuna or chicken for lunch. So no Sunday meal prep for me. But in general, Sunday meal prep has been my approach for years. Most recently, I tried getting creative for lunch one week, and I proudly showed off at work my savory barbecue Greek yogurt that I had made. It was fat-free, plain Greek yogurt I seasoned up with some smoky barbecue seasoning. Well, that pride of my accomplishment faded quickly after my manager pointed out I was just eating a dish of barbecue dip. Oh well, it was still good, but he was right. I really was just eating a bowl of barbecue dip. As I mentioned in the personal finance episode, packing a lunch is one of the ways I've cut costs in my daily routine over the years. So it was rare, even when I wasn't dieting, to not pack a lunch for work. First off, I own very few dedicated cooking items outside of obviously a stove. It's really just four items. An air fryer, which is a very recent ad, a basic crock pot, a basic rice cooker, and an air popper for popcorn. Let's start with the air fryer. I avoided owning one of these for years. I often avoid trends with every fiber of my being. I've just never been one to follow the latest, trendiest item. It's really for no other reason than I just don't want to jump on a bandwagon. As a result, I didn't get an air fryer for years. But then, most recently, over the last Christmas, I saw one on sale, and I had a few dishes I've been wanting to try in one, so I pulled the trigger and bought one. Well, here's where I became an air fryer convert. I don't know how I went so long without one. There is so many simple, healthy, and tasty meals I've made in mine. For example, two bags of frozen Brussels sprouts mixed it with a bit of cooking spray and salt and pepper. Just make sure with the cooking spray it's propellant free. Look at the container. It will say on there, propellant free. This is to not wreck the nonstick surface in your air fryer. I personally use Kroger brand vegetable oil or olive oil spray. Their store brands are propellant free and reasonably priced. I cook these in the air fryer until they are golden brown and delicious looking. I then place a simple piece of fish on foil on top like salmon, tilapia, or cod. That's it. Dinner is ready in 12 to 15 minutes. Or my favorite, and please excuse how I pronounce this, but the frozen store-bought takiyaki balls. These delicious dough balls stuffed with octopus have a gooey, creamy center, and are a staple of Kansai street food. I get these at my local Asian market or when I make trips to the Japanese market in Chicago, Matsui Marketplace. Just set the air fryer for 15 minutes and let it rip. Check the temp with an instant read thermometer. I use the Lava Tool PT12 Javelin. It was as good as the Thermoworks for a quarter the price. I then dip these in a simple sauce of soy sauce and chili garlic paste. God, are they good. The broccoli dino bites from all these I've mentioned in previous episodes are great in the air fryer. Or honestly, I'll just roast some eggplant with tofu and bell peppers. Let's talk about roasting chicken breasts or pork in the air fryer. It's so good. It took a bit to learn the timing on these. They cook much faster and the carryover cooking process happens much quicker in the air fryer. Meaning, if you want your chicken to be done just right, 160 degrees, you have to watch it closely and pull it at the exact right temperature. I found roughly 157 degrees and then let it rest on your cutting board and you'll get perfect, juicy, 160 degree chicken. Let me tell you, 
Marinate that chicken overnight with a little liquid smoke and Korean barbecue sauce, and it came out like it had been grilled over an open fire. Plus, living alone, my air fryer is the perfect size for cooking dinner for myself and having some leftovers. I even do my grilled cheese in my air fryer sometimes. Mist each side of the bread with a little bit I can't believe it's not butter spray, and then assemble an air fry. Flip halfway through. Just make sure to watch them. They go quick, and the air blowing did blow a slice of bread partway off on one of my sandwiches, creating a rather crazy looking and slightly burnt sandwich. Another item I love making in there is taking lightly toasted bread, place a slice of American cheese on top, and a slice of ripe beefsteak tomato. A touch of salt and cook until the tomato is soft and the exposed cheese in the corners is browned. Next is my crock pot. I have a large eight quart one with a basic dial for setting temp. The temp options are warm, low, and high. I use it a lot to make dried beans to go with rice or stew chicken in a sauce. I'll simply add dried beans, some broth or water, and stew until tender and creamy. Ladled over rice and vegetables, you have a great filling low fat dinner. I might add some higher fat protein for a bit of flavor, like a quarter pound of Italian sausage or chorizo. Chicken breasts, cooked with some tomatoes and vegetables and then shredded and served with pasta, rice or vegetables, or anything else you want, also makes a great meal from the crock pot. You can even do it like sloppy joes or pulled pork on bread or buns. Another thing I use my crock pot for is what I like to call the poor man's sous vide. I hunt goose every fall and love goose breast cooked mid-rare. I will put it in a Ziploc bag with a marinade or seasoning with a little butter or olive oil and then in the crock pot filled with water on the warm setting. I check the temp every hour or so and when the water gets above 150 degrees, I add a little bit of ice or cold water to keep it closer to 140 degrees. I will let it sit in there for four to six hours on a Sunday. Then slice it thin and serve it over rice, often kanji stew, a rice porridge, or some vegetables. As for my rice cooker, I use it purely for rice. Even though it has a steamer basket, I've never used it. I've owned the Black & Decker 16 cup one for years. I go that big because they tend to boil over if you overfill it. So it's easier to have a bigger one than worry about the mess. Plus, it uses the Asian rice cup measure, which is closer to three fourths of a cup than the traditional one cup in the US. Also, the 16 cup is cooked volume. So couple that with it being the Asian measurement and you really have a 12 cup rice cooker, which is only four cups of raw rice. And I would frankly never max out that capacity. I use the basic type that works off a heat measuring resistor to know when the rice is done versus a fancy electronic one. Mine has just a single flip switch, on or warm. I've only ever made white long grain rice in mine, so it's a major unitasker for me. But even so, with a culinary degree and 12 years experience, I struggle to make rice on the stove to this day. I know, funny, but it's like my kryptonite. As for the popcorn maker, I use it to make popcorn. I tried a microwave popper, but it's just not as good as the air popper. The only issue I have come across for air popper popcorn is getting the salt to stick. I use either a mist of pure oil spray, like a propellant free cooking spray, and then popcorn salt, which is super fine, or some sprays of I can't believe it's not butter, and then popcorn salt. As I mentioned many episodes ago, just because it says zero calories, it's not. Take I can't believe it's not butter spray. According to their own website, one serving is one spray or 0.2 grams. Up to four sprays contribute insignificant amounts of calories and fat. Six sprays contributes five calories or 0.5 grams of fat and 15 milligrams of sodium. I would argue using my own math, it's even a bit higher than that, but now we're just splitting hairs. Even still, on a two portion serving of popcorn, which makes eight or so cups for 220 calories, I might be adding 25 to 35 calories to my popcorn. Again, for maintenance and the fact that I still track most stuff, this is nothing, and it doesn't affect my overall calories too much. Either way, just make sure to keep this in mind when you're making your popcorn. There is calories in your zero calorie, I can't believe it's not butter spray. Again, I rarely track things like that spray when I do my calories, but I'm also rarely eating right up to my daily calorie number. As for other cooking methods, you can never go wrong with grilling lean proteins or broiling them. 
or air fried like I mentioned earlier. The only issue with cooking inside versus grilling is the lack of the smoky flavor, which can be easily solved with either a product like liquid smoke and adding a bit of that to your marinade or purchasing something like a smoked salt and finishing your meat after thinly slicing it with a light sprinkle of smoked salt to get that smoky flavor and add a little bit of extra flavor. Look for finishing salts or smoked salts in your store or online. Don't forget, you can also think of your broiler as an upside down grill. Simply place the meat onto a pan close to the broiler and cook it until done. There's always steaming as a cooking method, but I'll be honest, I rarely steam anything, only because I think it's missing flavor without added sauces and calories. Thus, in my view, canceling some of the benefits. If you're okay with less flavorful aspect of steaming, go for it. Baked foods are always nice too, like rice pilaf. I personally have always found baked rice to be so flavorful compared to other methods. It just takes longer than say cooking it on the stovetop or in a rice cooker. The Chef Jean recipe for baked rice and beans is a must try. I've mentioned it in previous episodes, but you must try it. One thing with his recipe is I cut the oil way down to as little as an eighth of a cup or less. Really just enough to help the seasoning coat the rice and keep the grains separated. As I mentioned earlier on, I've been doing intermittent fasting and as a result, I rarely eat breakfast. But I've missed having a routine on Saturday and Sunday mornings when I get up. For example, just like I used to do with my dad 34 years ago, every Saturday morning, I get up and watch this old house every season. Something I used to look forward to every Saturday with him. He spent many years working long hours in the military, but Saturdays were always our time to watch this old house, drink coffee, and eat breakfast before starting a house project. Yes, I was drinking coffee when I was eight years old. We are a huge family of coffee drinkers. The rule in our house growing up was whoever was first up made a pot of coffee. Once that pot was done, you poured it into a thermos and started a second pot. On weekends or holidays, that second pot was also poured into another thermos and then a third pot of coffee was started. We would have coffee ready to drink straight through dinner most days. These days, I skip breakfast and I make coffee, but I use an old-fashioned stovetop percolator and have made that my morning routine before sitting down to watch this old house. It's a slow process, but I find it to be a nice time to just slow down and start my weekend. As for this old house and the companion show, Ask This Old House, I would suggest everyone watch it. It's how I've learned the majority of the skills I have to do work around my house. I learned a lot from my dad before he died, but he taught me too that this old house was a great source of info, especially back in the pre-internet days. As I mentioned several times, I've really focused on using cooking as a time to slow down and just be in the moment through this whole journey. It takes me back to the part of cooking professionally I miss every day. I don't miss the crazy hours, the low pay, but I do miss the art and skill it required, and at times the intensity of it. I worked at a steakhouse for most of my career where I would be the only steak cook on a Friday or Saturday night. I would be the one to cook several hundred steaks in just five hours on those nights. Other than the main appliances I use around the house, my two primary pans of choice for cooking is a 10-inch non-stick wok for stir-fry and a 10-inch non-stick saute pan. One major tip for using non-stick is you only need a very small amount of oil when cooking, but commit to letting stuff brown. If you've never heard this before, there are three main ways to extract flavor. Oil, water, and alcohol. Most flavors in the world are broken down and transferred to your dish through one of those three methods. It's the one reason you will see most recipes have you start with garlic and onions and oil of some sort and then deglaze with a liquid, either alcohol or water-based stocks. Back to browning. When cooking at home in a nonstick, for example, when I'm cooking frozen diced potatoes, I'll just let them go. I'll go do other things in the kitchen like empty the dishwasher or clean up, just stirring and tossing them every once in a while while they brown. To that point, also don't crowd the pan or your food will steam. For example, if I am doing an egg white skillet, I'll do the potatoes and mushrooms until brown before I add vegetables that will introduce moisture and prevent browning. Also, think about mixing techniques when you're making dinner, like roasted chicken in the air fryer that gets nice and crispy brown to go with a rice porridge so you have different textures in your meal. Variety like that will make dieting or eating healthy more enjoyable. 
All of that said, if it's easier for you and you prefer a limited list of items for meals, feel free to do that. This was just my suggestions. I know lots of people who just do the same basic dinner day in and day out, and they're very happy with that. I personally need variety, but I can totally understand where they're coming from. For me, I just make sure to have tons of the same types of food around the house and then use different methods and flavorings to cook everything. If you get into a rut and struggle to find the desire or the drive to cook, this is where you need to find motivation or options to eat healthy. It is often too easy to slip into the bad habit of picking food up on the way from home or going to the grocery store on an empty stomach, which as we've discussed repeatedly in other episodes is never a good idea. I still find myself coming home with random items I shouldn't have or frankly didn't want once I thought about it, but because I went to the grocery store on an empty stomach, I grabbed them. Let's not even mention how few good options there are for pick up and go food items on your way home that are pre-made. Most easy to grab food is calorie dense. Pre-COVID, one of my go-tos would be the salad bar at the grocery store for lettuce and veggies, and then I would grab a can of tuna or chicken and light salad dressing and make that my dinner. In an effort to make cooking fun for myself, I use simple tricks to motivate myself, like trying to master a new recipe or cooking style. Like I mentioned in earlier episodes, my stretch trying to master mapo tofu, or my consistent experimenting with Korean or Thai-based recipes and concepts. Another trick might be to buy a new toy for the kitchen, like an air fryer or a vegetable spiralizer. I think it goes without saying, something like a deep fryer shouldn't be on that list of new toys if you're trying to eat healthy. Worst comes to worst, maybe embrace the lack of creativity or desire to cook and go with a mail order or local food delivery options like a meal kit service. There are some great ones out there that seem to come highly reviewed. With my background in cooking, I have only used two services, both for a very short period of time. That was HelloFresh for complete meal kits and Imperfect Foods for produce. But there are also ones like Trifecta if you're looking for heat and go, or Sun Basket and Home Chef if you want the meal kit option with cooking included. Keep in mind, these can be costly, and you'll have to really watch what you select to make sure it fits your meal plan. I would also suggest you plan ahead as much as possible. It might be a rough outline of things to make for the week or a strict meal plan. Your choice, but some sort of plan is a good idea. For example, I might make extra rice on Sunday and then portion it for the week and find creative ways to use it as add-ins to other items I'm cooking. Like I mentioned back a few episodes ago, This could be used for kimchi fried rice or mixed with vegetables and a protein for a stir fry or even stirred into a broth for a rice soup. My dad worked long hours and at one point he spent four years commuting two hours each way for his last base assignment in the military, but we always ate dinner as a family. This was our time and it was a special time no matter what time we made dinner, but we always ate dinner as a family. This was our time and it was special no matter what we made for dinner. My family has always made dinner and meals a time to celebrate family. One side effect of this was that food became a comfort item for me, and I think a major reason why I gained so much weight, especially when I was stressed or feeling down. But I still look fondly on those meals, especially since I've lost both my parents so early. One story my parents would tell that I think applies to this entire weight loss journey in cooking was that when my parents got married, my mom wasn't a great cook. As a result, the first year of marriage, my mom and dad would eat dinner together every night. My mom made a new recipe every night for that first year. Think about that. It was 365 unique dinners in one year. This ranged from items as fancy and complex as crepes filled with lobster thermidor, which was our traditional January 2nd meal, since we would do lobster for New Year's Eve, and standing rib roast for New Year's Day, my dad's favorite, but not my mom's, to one of my favorites as a kid, hot dogs stuffed with half a slice of American cheese, wrapped in bacon, and broiled till crispy. I'll never forget the first time I tried making this on my own. I somehow burnt the hell out of the hot dogs while still having raw bacon on the outside. My dad would joke about choking down some of the burned or awful tasting food, but he never complained. And by the end of the year, my mom and my dad had become very good cooks, something they carried with them through the rest of their lives. So with time, effort, and commitment, anyone can learn to cook. Even if like the one story they told, it means tossing dinner in the trash and making sandwiches from the only food in the house, toast and some canned sardines and mustard sauce, which strangely my dad enjoyed and I learned to love. To this day, I make that as a quick lunch sometimes. It reminds me of my dad and the fun times we'd have together eating lunch. Thanks to his travels in the military, he would often introduce us to unique things as kids that both my sister and I love to this day. 
For example, nothing better for a protein-packed breakfast or frankly any meal is this famous kippers and eggs. This can be an easy 350 calorie meal with 34 grams of protein, just a drained tin of kippers, these are lightly smoked herring fillets, and three whisked eggs. Warm and break up the kippers in a non-stick pan. When they are warmed through, pour in the eggs and cook until almost done in plate. If you can find fresh, meaning not canned, kippers, feel free to use that. This recipe can also be done with any smoked fish, like salmon or trout. We just grew up on canned kippers, but I've also made this with smoked salmon or trout, and it's equally as good. As I've mentioned before, canned items are a great way to keep calorie health, healthy-ish food on hand for last minute meals. My dad was a master at always making dinner fun. Whether it was his famous grilled chicken quarters, which we would have at least twice a month in the summer, or one of my favorites was potato night, where he would roast them on our Weber kettle grill. I still haven't used the special ring that goes around the inside of the grill with spikes you stick the potatoes into to roast them while grilling other foods. The best part of those potatoes was the crunchy skin with the tender, almost fluffy interior. Just salt and a touch of butter or sour cream. In the case of a diet, maybe fat-free plain Greek yogurt. Or maybe make some of my barbecue yogurt dip. Or a little light, I can't believe it's not butter. When my mom would be gone for her annual two weeks of training in the military, my dad would make dinner so much fun for us. Even if it was the simple nights on the picnic table using his machete to cut up watermelon for everyone in the neighborhood, or dinners of blueberries and heavy cream. Not the healthiest, but delicious. I hope as you can hear through these stories that even the most unorthodox or basic of meals can be enjoyable and fun and leave with lasting memories. Let's talk quickly about the art of leftovers. Leftovers can be a lifesaver. If you're not a fan of leftovers, feel free to substitute the term meal prep. I joke, but I know some people just are not fans of leftovers, but will happily meal prep. It's all about the mindset. I often pack up leftovers in separate containers for a multitude of reasons. One is that everything needs to be reheated differently for the best outcome, like rice should not be reheated the same way as steak or chicken. It also allows for things like last minute packing and freezing of leftovers for future use. For example, I might vacuum seal and freeze portions of cooked meat to use later, like in a bowl of instant ramen. Or the last and my personal favorite reason is it allows me to mix and match my leftovers and use them in new and creative ways. For example, I used veggie rice and venison to make four dinners, three with venison and rice, while one was rice turned into imitation crab with hosin sauce and sriracha stir fry. And the last was a venison kimchi stir fry. I love being able to use leftovers to make new items each night during the week. It makes cooking fun for me. Even in the days of my restaurant career, I would love the challenge of here's what you have and now make a meal. Even back in culinary school, we would have final exams like the Food Network show, Chopped. I vividly remember one final exam where we all picked numbers to get the order we would select, and then you had to pick the protein, vegetable, starch, and cooking method. Then you were expected to make an appetizer and entree using the ingredients and method. I would often push to be last. I found it easier to do that when you were forced into a corner and all you had was what was left on the cart to work with. As I've discussed in a lot of episodes, I've always preferred challenge over the easy path. It helps me focus and be the most creative. Try this with your meal prep or cooking at home. Here's an idea. Get three bags. Put a piece of paper in them with items you have at home. One for protein, one for vegetables, one for a starch. And then pick from the bags and build your dinner around that. This could even be a family event once a week, if not every night of the week. With core items around the house to flavor your dinner, you'd be surprised how creative you can be. A favorite of mine from when we were kids was the nights my mom and dad would make pudgy pie sandwiches with soup using leftovers. If you're not familiar with these, they are pressed sandwiches made in a cast iron campfire press. We used our gas stove burner to cook these in place of a campfire. We would put up a spread of items out on the table, like random leftover lunch meats, cheeses, and veggies, and build our pies between two slices of cheap white bread. Butter them lightly and then press and cook. It was always a fun night as a family. The soup my mom would often make was curried cream of mushroom soup, a super easy classic 60s and 70s recipe. All it was was a can of cream of mushroom soup, a shot of sherry, optional of course, and store-bought curry powder stirred together and heated up. Sometimes we would just use a canned tomato soup. Still, Campbell's canned tomato soup is the best tomato soup. Though, I did recently have to use up some tomato paste I had around the house. I googled uses for it and discovered you could turn this into tomato soup. 
Think of it as super concentrated soup. What I did was saute some onions and garlic in a little oil and then add the can of tomato paste. Brown that a bit to concentrate the flavor and caramelize it. This helps pull out a little bit of the natural sweetness of the tomatoes. Keep in mind, canned vegetables like this are often the ripest because they can't be transported easily to the store being as ripe as they are. Once the tomato paste was slightly toasted or browned, add water till you get the consistency you want. For me, it was about four to five cups. Then serve this with grilled cheese, obviously. I think the biggest takeaway is to find fun or interesting ways to motivate yourself to cook every day at home. And remember to pack meals for lunch and breakfast, if that's your thing, for at work. I can't stress this enough. Cooking your meals will help you understand what makes up your diet and what needs to be adjusted to hit your weight loss goals. I know my love of mayo has changed significantly now that I see the impact it has on my calories for the day. I do miss getting my QP mayo for topping fried rice. If you've never heard of it, QP mayo is from Japan and is absolutely amazing. But no matter what, have fun cooking healthy meals. It doesn't have to be a chore. Thank you for listening. Please join me again for future episodes. You can contact me at parachuteadvicepodcast at gmail.com. Again, that's all one word, parachuteadvicepodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at parachuteadvice. Again, thank you for listening, and please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.